and welcome back to the Self Sovereign Podcast. We discuss a range of topics related to autonomy and self-empowerment. My name is Justin Smith. I'm an independent documentary filmmaker. Today, our guest is Dr. Jenny Goodman. Dr. Jenny Goodman qualified as a medical doctor in 1982 and is a member of the British Society for Ecological Medicine. She has specialised in nutritional and environmental medicine for the last 20 years. Dr. Goodman has lectured extensively to other doctors, to practitioners of alternative medicine and to the general public. Dr. Goodman is the author of the book Staying Alive in Toxic Times, which explores the ways in which our environment can affect our health and offers practical advice for minimizing exposure to toxins. Dr. Goodman is passionate about providing information about these important issues. And in this episode, we include a number of useful tips that anyone can implement. Dr. Jenny Goodman, welcome to the Self Sovereign Podcast. Thank you. Could, could we start by uh, telling us what your motivation was for writing your book, Staying Alive in Toxic Times? Oh, yes. Well, when I started it, I'd been practicing ecological medicine for about 20 years. I'll explain in more detail later what that is. But I had been seeing patients getting better. And these were often patients who had been told by their doctor and assorted consultants that there was nothing to be done. Either there was no solution or they weren't really ill in the first place because it didn't fit a picture in the medical textbook. So they must be imagining it was all in their heads and so on. Um, and a lot of my patients said to me, the question always, at the end of a series of consultations, they were starting to get significantly better. The question was always, why didn't my GP know this? Why doesn't my GP know this? You know, why have I had to wait all these years and dig around to find an ecological doctor and so on? Why isn't this information in the public domain or even in the clinician's domain? And that's why I wrote the book because I felt that the, I've always felt the general public have a right to know about their bodies, how their bodies work, how medicine works or doesn't work. And for many years, I, I taught in adult education. Um, so it's about demystifying medicine and demystifying human biology. But most importantly, it's about empowering people that if they understand why we're getting ill, and so many of us are getting ill and staying ill, if they understand the root causes, in terms of nutritional deficits, in terms of environmental pollution, then they are in a position to do something about it, even if their doctor hasn't a clue. Okay. And in the introduction uh, to your book, you also mentioned that you were disappointed, you became disappointed by uh, conventional medicine um, because it was too focused, too focused on uh, symptoms and suppressing symptoms. That's one of the reasons I was disillusioned. I would say even more primary than that was the fact that although lip service was paid to the concept of the listen to the patient, he or she is telling you the diagnosis, that didn't happen in practice. And people only got any kind of treatment if their symptoms fitted the pattern of a known existing diagnosis in the textbook. And the fact that we have more and more diagnoses constantly being added to the list just indicates that that system of categorizing illnesses doesn't work. And what that system is used to do is to figure out what drug or surgical operation is needed. So the process of taking a medical history conventionally is getting a symptom pattern saying, oh, it fits the pattern of disease X for which the treatment is drugs Y and Z. And it, it's thinking in boxes, it's thinking narrowly. And it, it was never asking the question, why is this person ill? What happened? And what is their body perhaps missing that it needs to heal itself? And what is perhaps in their body that shouldn't be? You know, I'd see kids of two and three years old screaming in agony with eczema and they're being fed milk and they're being fed sugar and nobody wonders about their diet or possible allergies. They just slather steroid creams all over them, which stores up, you know, all sorts of problems like stunted growth and more problems into adulthood. So nobody was asking the question why, but when I asked that question on ward rounds, I either received a stony silence or the most astonishing answer, which I had from several consultants, which is my job is to treat. It is not my job to inquire about the reason why. 
And I think it should be medicine's job. And if we inquire about causes, we are then in a position not only to treat more effectively, but to do preventive medicine. And even now, medicine takes no account of the fact that we have serious pandemics. We have a global pandemic of cancer, of heart disease, of diabetes, of dementia, of autoimmunity, of neurodegeneration. And when I say global, I'm increasingly including the so-called developing world because they more, the more they adapt you know, our diet and our bad habits, the more they're also getting these diseases which two or three generations ago were unknown in places like Africa and Asia. So, you know, what kind of medical practice ignores all that evidence? I don't know. The evidence I mean is that these worldwide epidemics of chronic degenerative disease have causes and they have causes in terms of our nutrition, which is to do with industrialized agriculture and the junk food industry that's taken over from the real food we all had even 150 years ago and industrial pollution in the air, the water, and the soil, and therefore in our food, which is essentially poisoning us. And what I've been amazed to discover you know, in the process of writing my first book, I'm now in the process of researching for my second book, is that there is a vast amount of published data in peer-reviewed journals um, saying, showing very clearly the ways in which all these forms of environmental pollution are making us sick en masse. The evidence is there. It's not in obscure corners. It's in the public domain. And yet clinicians continue as though it was unknown. And, you know, medicine as a profession should be shouting from the rooftops, hey guys, meaning the oil industry, the pesticide industry, the fertilizer industry, um, and industrialized farming, you are making us sick. You know, I mean, the NHS, God bless, is going to collapse if we don't tackle the root causes of these pandemics of degenerative chronic disease. And the root causes are what we are doing to the planet and therefore to ourselves. Of course, um, looking at the uh, bigger picture of medicine as a whole, it is something of a mixed picture because um, although we, we, do, we do clearly have a, these epidemics of degenerative conditions, at the same time, life expectancy over the last century has increased a huge amount. In some countries, I think life expectancy has increased by about 40 years. Though sometimes people point to that and say, well, medicine is surely is not doing that bad if, if that's also the case. Okay, there are three answers to that, Justin. I'm glad you raised it because it's a centrally important myth, a misunderstanding. Firstly, average life expectancy has improved out of sight since Dickens' time in the mid-19th century, but that is because the average figure includes child's mortality. And if you go back to the 19th century, a quarter of all children died before their fifth birthday. As still not dissimilar in some countries in the developing world, which is why they have so many children, because they know some of them are going to die. If you take those child deaths, which were caused by infectious diseases like TB and scarlet fever and cholera and diphtheria, which have been eliminated by hygiene measures, by sanitation, by improved nutrition and much better living space. If you take those child deaths out of the equation, you have a completely different picture. And you see that people in the 19th century lived into their 80s and 90s, as they do now, but healthily without losing their marbles, without losing their cognitive faculties, without losing their mobility. I mean, the workhouse was a dreadful institution. It was wicked, but it was only possible because these elderly people in their 80s were able to work physically very hard six days a week. So actually, people have always lived this long, but previously they've lived healthily. So that's one basically statistical error that gives the lie to that myth of we're living longer. Secondly, what kind of logic is it that says, thanks to the wonders of modern medicine, we're now all living long enough to get a series of hideous diseases? Now in our last 15 years can be utter misery and make us completely dependent on our loved ones and all the state. Thirdly, and this is most important, we hear in regard to cancer and regard to dementia, these are diseases of aging. They are 
the result of an aging population. And it's not true because cancer is increasing fastest among children. It's due to environmental pollution. We are poisoning our children. And you, know, you can ask me later about the details of the ways in which we are doing that. It's increasing much faster among children than among adults. So it cannot be a disease of aging. And secondly, dementia. Right, Alzheimer, Dr. Alzheimer described what he called pre-senile dementia occurring in younger and younger people. His first patient was a woman of 51. Now, if you're in your 90s and you start forgetting your next door neighbor's name, that's normal. That is senility. You know, it's there in Shakespeare. That's pretty universal. But if that starts happening while you're in your early 50s, then it's worrying. And Alzheimer called it pre-senile dementia. And that's what Alzheimer's is. It's when that happens earlier than it should and more severely than it should. And in some of the most polluted capital cities of the world, they are recording what they're calling Alzheimer's disease in children. In children. This is to do with pollution and terrible nutrition. It's not to do with aging. I see. Um, in your in your book, you uh, provide an interesting timeline to put things into perspective. For example, 3.5 billion years ago, life begins on Earth. 600 million years ago, the first multicellular organisms. 200 million years ago, the first mammals. Um, 25 million years ago, the uh, first great apes. 2 million years ago, the first human species. 200,000 years ago, the first modern human species. Um, and then 100,000, sorry, 10,000 years ago, agricultural revolution, agriculture begins. And um, 200, 250 years ago, the start of the industri industrial revolution. And then it's, it's during the last 100 years or so that we see the epidemics of heart disease, Alzheimer's, and uh, many of the other degenerative conditions. Right, that's right. So in other words, these last couple of hundred years are a fraction of a fraction of a millisecond. They are a tiny snapshot in the midst of our very, very long billions of years of evolution. And biological evolution is a really slow process, whereas the rate at which we've changed our environment has been astronomically fast. And there's no way any human body can adapt to that level of industrial pollution. Now, some people are that better than others, and that's genetic. It depends on how good your liver enzymes are at detoxifying these pollutants. And purely by genetic chance, for example, some people can break down organophosphate pesticides much more effectively than others. The ones who get very sick from them are those who can't. But the reason they're sick is not because of faulty genes. Their genes aren't faulty, they're just different. And that genetic um, glitch, if you like, would have made no difference to their health at all prior to the Industrial Revolution. But, you know, those people were also the canary in the mine um, because eventually, you know, we'll all be going the way of those people with multiple chemical sensitivity. Do we have accurate estimates in terms of the number of chemicals that we've introduced into our environment during the last 100 years or so? Yeah, the estimates I've seen vary between 100,000 and 200,000. But I think it's about 100,000 that have been deliberately synthesized. You get another 100,000 from the degradation of those in the environment into other similar chemicals. And also by our own metabolism, you know, the liver tries to detoxify these synthetic artificial chemicals. But in doing so, because the liver detox system wasn't designed for this, it was designed, quote unquote, evolved for things like snake venom and scorpion bites, poison ivy, stinging metals, and our own hormones. Um, and therefore, it sometimes ends up making what's called a metabolite, product of metabolism, from these toxic chemicals into something that's even worse. So, you know, you'll find a substance in the body of someone who's been exposed to pollution that wasn't manufactured but their liver has manufactured it from the one that was manufactured. I see. And um, are there challenges in kind of proving, if you like, that these toxins are having serious health impacts? Yes. And there is a huge amount of evidence 
showing that they are. And the Lancet Neurology particularly had a fabulous study, Philippe Grandjean and a few other people. Um, and they picked half a dozen industrial poisons, I think lead, um, fluoride and a few synthetic compounds and showed very, very clear associations with increasing illness in the population that was children that were exposed to those things in utero. There are thousands of studies. What they can't usually show, because this isn't what happens, is a one-to-one -one relationship between one toxic chemical and one particular disease. It doesn't work like that, partly because we are never, never ever exposed to just one toxin. We are constantly exposed to what's called um, a cocktail a mix of all sorts of chemicals, some from inhalation, some from swallowing, some from skin contact, some from food, um, some from water. You know, you, you can't, you can't, there's no way you can do the kind of trial that conventional and pharmacological medicine uses, which is the randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trial. Because you can't take a whole bunch of people and expose them to a toxin. It wouldn't be ethical. It also wouldn't be practical because they're already exposed to hundreds of other toxins. So you can't do a one-to-one -one relationship between toxin X and disease Y. We're all exposed to multiple toxins. And, and I describe in my book very many ways to avoid most of them because we can, if we're aware where they are, there are ways to avoid them and there are also ways to detoxify them out of your body. Um, but you're not going to get a one-to-one -one relationship. And because we're all genetically different, we're all biochemically different. The same kind of pollutant exposure that gives one person multiple sclerosis will give another person rheumatoid arthritis, will give another person you know, inflammatory bowel disease, will give another person chronic fatigue, will give another person cancer. The differences in disease manifestation are due to our biochemical individuality, but the causes are the multiplicity of chemical and electromagnetic pollution to which we're all now exposed. And um, in your book, there was, um, well, I say interesting, but obviously not interesting for the person who suffered this condition, but um, there is a pilot who you mentioned that the case study of a pilot who has been, um, well, actually, I did, many of us, of course, don't know this, that we're exposed to so many toxins whenever we take a flight. And I thought it was an interesting one to highlight because it shows how we go into various environments believing that the environment is benign and not hazardous, not knowing that we are actually put, putting ourselves at significant risk for health problems. That's right. I've seen a lot of pilots and a lot of cabin crew, you know, the air stewards and stewardesses, and quite a few frequent flyers who've become very ill. And what we found in biopsy of their fat cells is that some of the chemicals which are in the air on the airplane are in their bodies and most of them are neurotoxic. Now, some of them, most of them in fact, are very similar to the kind of industrial pollutants that are released on a main road from exhaust fumes. But the crucial difference is you're in an enclosed environment, you can't open the window on the plane, the ill-advised. What people don't know is that the air in the cabin and also the air in the cockpit that the pilots are breathing comes direct from the aeroplane engine. It comes direct, un more or less unfiltered from the jet engine. It's supposed to be filtered, but the filters don't work very well. So you get something called tricrysyl phosphate. Tricrysyl phosphate is uh, it's an oil, it's a lubricant that is crucial for the rapidly moving little metal parts of the engine um, to move at 500 miles an hour, which is how fast you're flying, safely. But because they're moving so fast, um, it burns the oil essentially. So you're getting burnt lubricant oil products in the engine and therefore sometimes they leak into the cabin. It's like the smell of sweaty socks. It makes some people throw up. It makes some people very ill, sometimes short term, sometimes long term depending on their genetic detox capacity. It's called a fume incident. Airlines sometimes acknowledge it and sometimes don't. But even if you don't have an acute episode, a fume incident, you have low level chronic exposure and the pilots and cabin crew often get very sick from it. And one of the heavy metals I find in the system is nickel because the moving parts of the engine contain nickel. Stainless steel is 14% nickel. 
And because they're moving so fast, nanoparticles of nickel, too small for the body to filter out through the lungs, get into the system. And there's also you know, in-flight magazine, which is outgassing toluene, very toxic substance. And there's those polystyrene um, in cups and meal trays, which are outgassing styrene, a toxic gas. And if you're going to a tropical destination, they may be spraying insecticide, which is also lethal. So there's a whole hideous cocktail. And as I say, you can't open the window. Uh, the other thing that I thought was um, worth mentioning about the case study with the pilot is that um, just contrasting the conventional approach that was taken, I read that uh, you know he, he was kind of led into this reductionist approach that m many of us are uh, to go and see lots of specialists. And of course, none of those specialists were able to identify the problem. No, it's partly because what they're looking for is not the root cause, but the category, right? So their first problem is which specialist do you go to? So the pilot whom I describe in the book, um, although they're all very different, he had primarily neurological symptoms. So he ended up with a neurologist. But I think that patients I've seen with aerotoxic syndrome have been to every specialist in the book. So they've been to respiratory physicians because they often have chest problems like asthma or something that looks like asthma. And they've been to gastroenterologists because often their digestive tract is badly affected by the chemicals. They've been to immunologists because they're having allergic eruptions and, and rashes in response to just about anything. And, and so on and so on. They've been to rheumatologists because they get swollen, painful joints. And the thing about these specialists is they never sit together in one room and discuss the patient. They never say, gosh, look, this poor chap, poor chap Hetz, has got symptoms in the nervous system, the circulatory system, the respiratory system, the digestive system, and every system. They just don't think like that. So, of course, most of the people I see have got symptoms in every system of the body. And part of the reason is as follows. The toxic chemicals we're talking about, not just on aeroplanes, but, you know, everything in the soil, the water and the air, from car fumes to pesticides to plasticizers to the non-stick coating on your frying pan or the water repellent coating on your raincoat, um, all of these substances... Um, especially plastics and the pesticides, they're all petrochemicals. And what that means is they're lipophilic, okay? They're attracted to fat as opposed to water. They're hydrophobic, lipophilic. They dissolve in fat. Now, we have a lot of fatty tissue in our body. We're meant to have. It needs to be good fat, not bad fat. That's another topic. But the point is that the cell membranes are also made of fat. And so once these lipophilic compounds get into our body, which they can do through the skin or food or drinking them, um, they will then get through the cell membranes and therefore they will get into every compartment, every system of the body. That's why we see multi-system disease. Now, conventional medicine, because it's made entirely of specialisms, doesn't know what to do with multi-system disease. And the GP, who's the only thing we've got anywhere near a generalist, the GP is going to say, well, you know, bring me one problem. Max, bring me two problems, but you're bringing me five or six problems. It must be all in your head, right? Multi-system illness is diagnosed as psychological. The irony is that when the GP says it's all in your head, they may be literally correct because the brain is made very much of fatty tissue. And that's why these toxins head to the brain. And they're responsible for an awful lot of mental illness as well as cognitive decline and neurological symptoms like fatigue, photophobia, being unable to tolerate the light, hyperacusis, being unable to tolerate sound, um, and numbness and tingling and all the neurological sensations that these people get, it's because there are indeed poisons in the brain. And in only that sense, is it all in their head. I think um, many people have a general idea that the uh, toxic buildup in the body is more of a secondary factor in our health complaints. Uh, I think it's common to assume that, but, but from your work, it seems to be very, very often at the root cause of people's problems. And it's primary. I mean, there are certain conditions, particularly liver disease, um, 
and gut dysbiosis, you know, having the wrong balance of the friendly and the unfriendly bacteria in the gut and eating rubbish, basically, those things certainly produce a lot of toxins in the gut, which then affect the liver. So we can create our own toxins in that way. Um, and, you know, if you're taking artificial hormones, you're putting a huge burden on the liver's detox capacity. But mostly what we're seeing is that combined with um, pollutants coming from external sources. And a lot of these are what's known as uh, POPs, persistent organic pollutants. Do look it up, persistent organic pollutants. But I should explain that organic in this context does not mean your nice fresh vegetables grown without any pesticides. It's a term in chemistry that simply means a substance that contains carbon. There was originally, originally derived from living things. But if you think about coal or crude oil, they were de originally, they were derived from living things that died millions of years ago. But, you know, they've been dug out of the earth where they were safely hiding and put through all sorts of chemical processes and turned into toxins. But they're still technically organic in the sense of carbon. So persistent organic pollutants is anything from PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, and DDT, one of the first insecticides, which is still in circulation because although it was banned decades ago, it's very persistent. It's been found in the Arctic ice, in the fat of polar bears. It's going round and round the planet. We can't throw it away because there is no place called away. And also, wickedly, when it was banned in Western Europe, it was that there were loads and loads of supplies left over that they then couldn't use. So guess what? They exported them to what they call the third world. And still in, in parts of India and Africa, these banned chemicals are being thrown around uh, very casually because they don't come with warnings. And anyway, the newer replacements that have been made that are supposed to be safer are not safer. They were all originally derived from nerve gases from the First World War. So it is not surprising that they do most of their damage to the nervous system. You mentioned earlier that uh, there's sometimes a genetic predisposition to uh, being susceptible to accumulating toxins in the body. Yes. Is that the main factor? Are there other factors as well that people could be aware of? You mean the main factors in how, in terms of how ill it makes you? What, yeah, why why someone seems to get a lot of symptoms okay. related to toxicity and someone else doesn't? Because we're all genetically different and therefore we're all biochemically different. And the key difference here is this, right? Our liver produces detoxification enzymes. You learn about detoxification in medical school, but you assume that the process works A, perfectly, and B, identically in everyone. So for example, you know, Enzyme X will cotton on to chemical Y and it will break it up and it will make it safe. And in order to do so, it, the enzyme, requires as cofactors, as helpers, a couple of minerals and a B vitamin. But they assume you've always got enough of the couple of minerals and the B vitamin, which we haven't, partly because of nutritional deprivation, which is very real all over the world, but also because there's so many chemicals to detox that those very detox reactions are using up the vitamins and minerals, which are crucial for them to work properly. Now, there are differences in people's innate genetic capacity to detoxify. So these detox enzymes, some of them will work better in one person than in another. And you know, since we've sequenced the human genome, we're able to test that. There are lots of companies that do it, and I've tested lots of patients, and you do always find the ones who've been made very, very sick by, for example, an, an exposure to insecticides being sprayed in their home, something like that, usually have got, it's not a major genetic abnormality, not like a chromosome abnormality. It's, it's a glitch which is normally totally compatible with life in a natural environment. But they've got a very slight difference. It's called a SNP, which is a single nucleotide polymorphism. So the difference, if you imagine that our genes are made of DNA, the oxyribonucleic acid, long, long strand of DNA made up of millions of subunits. Imagine it's like the length of a play, like Hamlet. One letter is raw. That's all, one letter. So you still get the sense of the sentence, you get the sense of the play. But that very slight error now in our modern industrialized world 
makes a huge difference because it means when that person encounters something like um, an organophosphate pesticide, they can't break it down properly and so it accumulates. But to get really ill in that way, two things are required. One is the genetic glitch and the other is exposure to the stuff. And I think the focus should be on reducing exposure to the stuff. There's nothing we can do about the glitch except know that it's there. So I've had to say to some patients, you know, actually, you're only going to be 100% healthy living up a mountain or in the desert or by the seaside because you haven't got the capacity to deal with these toxic chemicals. But having said that, even in such people, the capacity to, to deal with and detox these things can be vastly improved by good nutrition. It really can, as well as by knowledge of how to avoid the exposure. And also the number of people who have these so-called bitches is very large. You know, it's estimated to be about a quarter to a third of the population. There's not a small minority. I see. Um, I understand that um, there could be potentially almost any symptoms associated with the uh, buildup of toxins in the body. But are there any common sort of symptom profiles that people could look out for to say, like, you know, to have an indication that the toxins could be the main, the root cause of their, their problem? Well, I mean, to be honest, uh, one of the best symptoms is getting better when you go on holiday. You know, I mean, that can be because you're no longer exposed to the mould that is so common inside homes in the UK from dampness and lack of ventilation. Now we're all being told to insulate. We're keeping in the condensation. And, you know, moulds in that way is is just as bad as synthetic toxins. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of resisting the temptation to give you a typical profile because if I do, right, for example, I could, I could say, I could say, um, gut problems, chronic fatigue and headache, but that can equally be due just to bad diet. You know, I mean, we have to address both ends of this. We have to address the good stuff that we're failing to put in, get fresh, real food, organically grown vegetables, organically reared, free range, grass fed meat, poultry, fish from clean oceans, eggs from free range, grass ranging hens, and loads and loads of organic vegetables, a little bit of fruit, and not too much of everything else. If we ate like that, and um, if we're very ill, if we juiced the organic vegetables as well, then we're putting in all the good stuff. And, you know, I would obviously, I would blood test people for mineral and vitamin deficiencies. And if improving the diet doesn't do it, I would tweak it with supplements of the relevant vitamins, minerals, and essential fatty acids, omega 3s, and the good omega 6s. That's putting in the good stuff. And actually, clinically, you always do that before you attempt to take out the bad stuff. Because if you start trying to detox somebody and they're already weak and malnourished, it won't work. I mean, partly because what the liver enzymes need for detox is really good levels of minerals and vitamins. And what the cell membranes need is really good levels of healthy fats. You know, fats from grass-fed animals or organically produced cultural oil. And if it's vegetable oil, it needs to be not just organic, but cold pressed and kept in dark glass bottles and not used for cooking, only used as salad dressing or to pour on your steamed broccoli or whatever, because we are cooking with these dreadful, dreadful synthetic vegetable oil that uh, looks like wee wee and it's kept in plastic bottles on the supermarket shelf. And we're talking trans fats. We're talking the kind of molecules that interfere with cell membrane function. The cell membrane's job is to sort of legislate what goes into the cell, what comes out of the cell. And that's all messed up by the kind of vegetable oils that we are eating. And you see them all over the British countryside. You see these pretty yellow fields of waving yellow flowers, oil seed rape. You know, it's junk. We don't need it. And the same with most of the hybrid wheat they're growing, not to mention the sugar beet. We don't need that stuff. We need little mixed organic farms where the animals are basically ranging around on the land, pooing on the earth, fertilizing it naturally, where they grow a different crop in the same patch each year so that they're recycling the nutrients. This is regenerative farming. And the reason I'm mentioning it is that the choices that farmers make are going to affect our health far more than the decisions that doctors make in the future. 
Although having said that, the decisions that farmers make are very constrained by the government. We're still subsidizing the big monocrop agrochemical farms rather than the little mixed family farms which are producing organic safe food, which is what we need. But you know, there's not just industrialized agriculture, there's the junk food industry, um, which is, you know, filling us with um, you know, donuts and cakes and biscuits and crappy white bread and all that stuff that isn't food. It's fake food, but it's addictive and it's meant to be addictive. Uh, and we're not going to get well and the NHS is not going to recover while we're all still eating that stuff. But of course, it's about money and power and politics. And the very concept of a food manufacturing industry really does, does my head it. I mean, food is not that which is manufactured. If it's manufactured, it's not food. If it's food, it's grown not manufactured. Sorry, that was a bit of a rant, wasn't it? It's okay. It's all useful information. Um, do we, uh, why, why is it that young people are more susceptible to problems of, uh, related to toxins? Well, I'm not sure that young people are more susceptible. It's that young people are living and growing up in a far more polluted world than their grandparents did. You know, their grandparents are now exposed to pollution, but perhaps they weren't when they were very young. And of course, um, yeah, if you're a baby or a young child, you are more vulnerable because firstly, this is just physics. When you're smaller, you've got a higher surface area to volume ratio. Okay, the bigger you get, the smaller the ratio of your surface area to your volume. So that means you've got more absorptive surface. So you're absorbing more through your skin. Uh, you know, if you're if you're putting on, I don't know, some nasty petrochemical moisturizer, there are creams for children with eczema and dry skin which are purely petrochemical. If you're rubbing that into a two-year-old, they're absorbing proportionally much more than if you're rubbing it into a twenty-year-old. So that's one thing. And similarly, they are because they're smaller, they're shorter. Their noses, toddlers' noses, are at the same height as the exhaust pipe. You're crossing the street with your toddler. They're breathing in proportionally more fumes than you are because you're three or four feet higher up. So, so, and also, you know, the immune system is still developing. The detox system isn't expecting to have to deal with all this stuff. Um, I mean, the very young and the very old are more vulnerable to everything. Um, but, you know, today's children are growing up in a much, much more polluted world than their grandparents and great-grandparents did. I see. And um, what are the ways that we can test for uh, for the, the burden of toxins in the body? Yeah. It's difficult. Um, there are more labs in London, and particularly there's uh, VHL, Viva Health Laboratories. Uh, there are a couple that I used to use, which no longer exist, sadly. Um, so yeah, there's Viva Health Laboratories and they can connect with laboratories in America that do a lot of testing of toxins, such as Doctors Data and Great Plains. Um, it used to be called Great Smokies, I think. So yeah, either directly here in London through VHL or indirectly using their courier service, Doctors Data and Great Plains in America, you can test. There's lots of ways. For example, if someone's had a lot of intake of pesticides, their liver will turn those pesticides into something else, metabolites, which can be found in the urine. So you can find out quite a lot from a simple urine test. But I would say, and the way I and my colleagues in ecological medicine work is we don't rely firstly on the test, we rely secondary on the test. We rely primarily on what's called taking an environmental history. So if somebody comes to see me, I'm not just asking about their medical history. I'm not just asking about their diet history, although I would take a diet diary. I'm asking about all potential chemical exposures from the age of minus nine months. In other words, from conception. So I will ask, you know, what was your mom's occupation when she conceived you? Was she, was she working in a chemical factory? Uh, was your dad working in a nuclear power plant? Um, did your mum have mercury fillings, you know, the grey silver amalgam fillings uh, when you were conceived? Because they will have released some mercury into the bloodstream that would have badly gone through the placenta. Um, and right through the parent's occupational history, the patient's own occupational history, 
asking questions that people wouldn't think about. Have you ever dyed your hair? Hair dyes are toxic. They go in through the scalp. Do you spray air freshener around your home? Because there are countless chemicals we use around our homes that we could easily dispense with. Do you cook in aluminium pots and pans? That's fine for boiling an egg, but it's not fine for cooking rhubarb because the acidity of rhubarb or anything with lemon or tomato, anything fruity, will leach the aluminium out. And do you cook salmon in the oven by squeezing lemon juice on it and wrapping it in foil? Because that aluminium will be leached out into the salmon by lemon. And, and you know, you can use, um, is it a company called uh, You Care or We Care or something that makes um, safe paper type products that you can wrap things in. Um, or you just cook in a ceramic dish with a lid on. You don't need to wrap anything in foil. Are you wrapping cold food in cling film, that type, type of plastic wrap stuff? Because that's full of a substance no one can pronounce. It's phthalates, P-H-T-H-A-L-A-T-E-S. And phthalates are used to give plastics their plastic quality, their bendability, if you like, their flexibility. And particularly in warm temperatures, and um, that goes straight into the food and it goes straight into the water. So if you've got water in plastic bottles, you put it on the shelf above the radiator or you leave it in your car on a hot sunny day, the phthalates will come out of the plastic into the water. They are estrogen mimics, right? They look to the body like estrogen. So they sit on the estrogen receptors. They are partly responsible for our epidemic of breast cancer. And other cancers of the female reproductive tract, like, you know, the ovary and the womb. And they may also be implicated in prostate cancer in men. It's difficult to do the studies, but there is a huge amount of circumstantial evidence. Because I, I was personally surprised to read in your book that um, stainless steel cooking material might not be the best to use as well. well it's not a problem for everyone. It really isn't. Um, it is 14% nickel. And as I was saying about aluminium, the nickel's only going to come out into the food if the food is acid. Um, so I only worry about it with patients whom I know have nickel toxicity and or nickel sensitivity. Some women have a very strong allergic reaction to nickel. They come out in a rash. If anything nickel or, or stainless steel with nickel in it touches their skin, for example, you know, um, a watch or a buckle of a bra or a bracelet, something like that. They can't wear stainless steel jewelry, only gold or silver. So for someone like that, I'd say, think about changing your cookware over, obviously not to aluminium, but away from stainless steel towards either old fashioned cast iron or ceramic or glass or something like Le Creuset, but you have to get the one with two handles because they're terribly heavy to lift, and, but not the non-stick version because non-stick pans are mostly coated with PFOs or uh, perfluorinated, PFAs, perfluorinated chemicals. Uh, there are many of them. They're incredibly dangerous. And now, actually, you can get a type of pan which is non-stick without those toxic chemicals. They're called green pans. Green pans uh, in London, you can get them at John Lewis's. And they, they are very expensive because they're using a combination, I think, of and and diamonds, something like that, to make but to make the uh, non-stick surface. But I also think we have to stir. You know, we have to ditch the deodorant and wash, and we have to stop expecting we can leave something frying in a pan for ten minutes and go away and do something else. We have to stir from time to time. Um, so yeah, cookware is a thing. Personal care products are a thing. Like uh, you know, the aftershave and the perfume and all these things are full of artificial fragrances. Now, what perfume used to be was literally flower essences. And you can still get that. You can still get essential oils of jasmine or lavender or orange flower or geranium. Um, all these wonderful smells. Now, they don't last all day precisely because they're natural. Uh, the body degrades them within a couple of hours. But, you know, they're tiny. You can carry them around with you if you want to smell beautiful. You can put them in an oil burner with a beeswax candle underneath and scent your house in that way rather than using to toxic air fresheners. But again, people have to ask themselves why the air in their house needs freshening in the first place. Just open the windows, right? And 
if if the toilet smells terrible, that's because you're eating something raw. You know, it's not about spraying air freshener. Um, yeah, similarly, the moisturizers, everything else that people put in and on themselves, um, 90% of these products are unnecessary. And the other 10% have got safe, natural, herbal replacements. How about the... I was just going to ask about the uh, detergents we use for washing clothes and for washing the dishes. Well, we're using all sorts of really heavy detergents, which are not good for us. Interestingly, some of them are in toothpaste as well. So I would only ever get natural herbal toothpaste with no detergents and no fluoride. If you swallow too much of that detergent in the toothpaste, it messes with the lining of your stomach. Um, but yes, we are washing our dishes in far stronger chemicals than we need. Those kind of chemicals are only needed to pour down the drain once a month, not to wash the dishes. So I use them um, for washing up either Suma, S-U-M-A. It's a, a wonderful Yorkshire company um, who make really safe washing up liquid um, or Ecova. Ecova is okay for most people if you're not too sensitive. And the same for laundry. Now, with laundry, there's not just the hazard of the um, chemical products that people use to wash it, which you have to completely cut out, especially if you've got a child with eczema. Um, but it's the clothes themselves, because if it's organic cotton or organic linen or hemp, again, fabric made from something that grew in the earth, it's absolutely fine. Yes, the laundry process shreds the tiny fibers and they get released into the, the air, the water, the earth. But if they're made of pure organic cotton or linen or hemp, that's just a plant going back to the earth. However, most of our clothes these days are made from synthetic fabrics, you know, nylon, rayon, um, polyester, poly this, poly that. It means a polymer, an artificially created molecule made of many smaller molecules strung together in a way that doesn't break down, they don't biodegrade. So when we're buying these synthetic clothing and then we're putting them in a wash, we are releasing these particles and they are microplastics into the water, into the air and into the earth. And suddenly now everyone's woken up to the dangers of microplastic. Because plastic doesn't really degrade, it just breaks down into smaller and smaller bits of itself. And because it's so small, you can inhale it, you can swallow it. We know that it's poisoning the whales and the marine life, and it's doing the same to us. And this is something that we can change by consumer power. If we stop buying synthetic clothes, look at the label and put it back unless it's cotton. And then stage two is to make sure it's organic cotton. And stage three is to make sure it's 100% organic cotton. Because some manufacturers are getting in on, you know, um, on a wave of public concern and saying, made with organic cotton. That could just be 10%. It's got to be not just made with, it's got to be made of 100% organic cotton. And um, are there some uh, simple ways that people can do some simple detoxification for themselves at yes. home? Yes. So in terms of what individuals can do, number one, despite everything, eat organic and free range when it comes to, you know, free range organic for eggs and meat and dairy produce. Secondly, we haven't really discussed this yet, get a water filter, ideally a plumbed in water filter, because sadly, our tap water is full of chlorine. Now they say they put that in to kill the bacteria. And you do have to make the water microbiologically safe, but they do that in Holland by um, exposing it to ultraviolet light and running it through fine physical filters. So they have clean, safe water without any chlorine in it. So the filter should remove the chlorine. Our government uh, sees fit to introduce fluoride, artificial fluoride into the water supply of the rest of Britain. It's already there in Birmingham and the West Midlands. But, and I've seen so many children from the West Midlands with damaged bone development and damaged brain development because they've had fluoride in their water for, since 1964. Um, and it's a toxin. It's actually a waste product of the phosphate fertilizer industry. 
And I had 40, 50 years ago, they were told, you can't release this from factory chimneys, it's too toxic. Fast forward to now, they've persuaded certainly the American Dental Association, and it looks like the British Dental Association, but none of the equivalents in mainland Europe, that it's good for children's teeth and we've got to put it in the drinking water. The way to keep children's teeth healthy is to keep them off sugar and to brush their teeth. That's simple, but it's not profitable for anyone, which is why we're being told we've got to have fluoride in the water, in the toothpaste, in the dental floss, in the mouthwash, in the dentist surgery, they put fluoride drops on children's teeth without telling them. And they tell the kids not to rinse, to keep the fluoride on the teeth. Fluoride damages the bones, the brain, the ovaries, the kidneys, the thyroid gland. And both fluoride and chlorine push iodide and iodine, respectively, out of the body, which is one of the reasons we've got an epidemic of thyroid illness. So get a good plumbing water filter. I make a couple of recommendations in the book um, to filter out the chlorine, if necessary, the fluoride, but also the heavy metal residue, the pesticide and nitrate residues that the water companies don't manage to remove. And also the antibiotics and hormones and other drugs. Now, what are they doing in the water? They're in the water because humans and animals are peeing them out. So any woman is on the pill or HRT, any animal that's injected with hormones, which is legal now we've left the EU, um, or will be shortly, um, and any person or animal that's on antibiotics, and of course many intensively reared non-organic farm animals are on routine antibiotics, low dose, but it's cumulative, and there are millions of them. All of this is being peed out, either directly into the soil or via our sewage system, and ends up in our water supply. So you want all that taken out of your drinking water. So those are the two most important things. Eat organic and get a water filter. If you've got to walk somewhere in the city, and of course we should be walking, take the back route. Don't walk along the main road because you want to, you know, avoid the worst of the traffic. If there's really a lot of traffic and you've got a small child, pick them up, put the shopping in the buggy and carry the child so their nose isn't right by the exhaust fumes. Um, and most of all, have a look at your kitchen cupboards, the cupboard under the sink, and your bathroom cabinets. Get a magnifying glass. Read the ingredient list on all those chemicals you don't need that you're putting on various parts of your body or spraying around your home. You don't need all those surface cleaners and you don't need all that deodorant. They're all. Would you. Sorry, would you advise people to have the um, uh, mercury amalgam fillings removed? Well, yes, but, right, it's a hugely important but, not by your high street dentist, because the drilling would only release more mercury into the system. But if you've got amalgam fillings and you're perfectly well at the moment, there's no rush, but long term, I do think it's worth doing for prevention of neurodegenerative disease, because mercury is a neurotoxin, you know, it's very closely linked with Alzheimer's, with multiple sclerosis, with Parkinson's disease, and so on. But if the dentist just drills all those mercury fillings out in a normal way, they're releasing much more mercury into the system. So there is a society, actually there are two, there's the British Society for Mercury-Free Dentistry, and there's the IAOMT, International Academy for Oral Medicine and Toxicology, and they have protocols which dentists have to adhere to, and they have to have done their trainings, and they have proper trainings to show the dentist a completely different technique. And it involves putting a rubber dam around the tooth that you're working with to protect the rest of the mouth, very high speed suction, extract a fan in the ceiling, nasal oxygen, so you're not inhaling mercury vapor in the air, you're just inhaling from a cylinder. Um, and significantly, any dentist who takes this seriously and who knows that mercury is toxic will be wearing a special mask themselves, <clears throat> even post-COVID and pre-COVID. And it's not for infection, it's to stop them inhaling mercury particles, which means they take it seriously. Second but is you must be in tip-top condition nutritionally before you do this. It is a detox procedure. And even in the best hands, a little bit of mercury will be released into the system in the process. 
in addition to the drip, drip, drip that's been being released the whole time you've had those feelings in your mouth, possibly since childhood. So probably 2 to 5% of what would be released by an ordinary dentist doing it, but that's not nothing. You can handle it if you've got really optimal levels of vitamin C, all the B vitamins and selenium and zinc and iodine and magnesium and all these minerals which are crucial for protecting you against the incursion of toxic minerals. So if somebody came to me with that question, I would always spend four to six months minimum getting their nutrient tip top. Ideally, I would measure their mercury levels so we could compare afterwards. So it's three stages. Opt one, optimize the nutrition. Two, have them safely removed by an expert dentist. Three, then you're in a position to really detoxify the mercury and the tin, because there's tin in them as well, um, that remains in your system from the years of having had the filling. And the detox methods I describe in chapter seven of my book, um, here is the book, Stay Alive in Toxic Time, uh, a seasonal guide to lifelong health. And chapter seven is called Tox Detox. You can't poison the planet without poisoning the people. And in chapter seven, I describe in detail what the toxins we're exposed to are, where they come from, what to do about them, and how to detox. And there are seven methods of detoxification, and most people can do most of them. And uh, you mentioned testing for mercury. If someone has amalgam fillings and they test for mercury, and it indicates that they don't uh, have have high levels, yeah. would there be an argument for not removing them then? Yeah, there would. And actually, it's a dilemma I've had in the clinic many times. But I would test by several methods. I would do a stool test to see if it's coming out through the digestive tract. And there's a couple of labs in Germany that do that. Um, and I would do indirect testing, like there's the Melisa Foundation, which will look at how sensitive your lymphocytes are, your white blood cells, to mercury. Right? It's normal for the white blood cells to react to any toxic metal, but they will vastly overreact if you've been exposed to that for a long time and it's a problem for you. You can, you can quantify that. And Melisa has a headquarters in the UK now as well as in Europe. So I would test by two or three different methods uh, and if any of them show a problem, I would assume there is a problem. If it really looks like someone hasn't got mercury, um, even though they've got the fillings, then while they remain well, there is an option to do nothing. I mean, you know, it's, it's an individual choice. Um, 20 years ago, I had all my mercury amalgam safely removed, but even though I had absolutely no symptoms whatsoever, there wasn't anything wrong with me. But I had a family history that made me think, I don't want a neurotoxic metal in my head. And actually, although I'd had no symptoms before, um, I did have something spectacular happen afterwards, which was my dreams became much more vivid and clear and easier to recall. It wasn't like I'd had a problem, but definitely my head was clearer. And that was after the last one went. And we should say that, you know, mercury and tin and all the things that then these silver fillings, silver as well, copper, uh, they're metals. <clears throat> so not only do they have a chemical effect, they have an electromagnetic effect. And uh, a good dentist that does this removal will be able to measure how many amps or mini amps, mini volts they're producing in the mouth. An electric current in the mouth is not a good thing. Saliva is an electrolytic fluid. It's got various salts in it. So you've got an anode and a cathode. You've got a battery, an electric circuit set up in the mouth if you've got any metal fillings at all, except gold. If you've just got gold, it seems to be not so much of a problem. And so that's another reason for removing them. But you know, it's a big deal. It's an expensive procedure. It's not something anyone's going to do casually if they feel perfectly well and they test negative. Uh, and they, yeah, but if they test positive mercury and or they've got neurological symptoms, yeah, I think it's worth doing. But how did we ever think that it was okay to put mercury in the in the head? Well, dentists love it because on a mechanical level, it's ideal. It's really easy to mould. It's technically much easier than the new white fillings. The most high street dentists think of the white fillings still as temporary fillings. And if they put them in, they do it badly and they fall out. Whereas the specialist dentists know how to get the mouth 100% dry and they work better with these 
um, newer white fillings. If you look at Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll, there's a character called the Mad Hatter. This isn't just something that Lewis Carroll got out of the blue. It was known that people who made hats went mad because mercury was used, whether they knew that connection or not, but mercury was used in the process of manufacturing hats. And today, dentists have a very high rate of psychiatric illness and suicide. And I don't think it's more stressful being a dentist than it is being you know, a policeman or a doctor in A&E. Um, but they are exposed to mercury. I've had patients who are retired dentists with mercury poisoning and also dental nurses who mix the amalgam. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the word is getting out on the danger of mercury fillings and fewer are being put in. But they are still being put in, even in children. Um, I think they've stopped doing it in pregnant women now, but, you know, that tells you it's not safe. Um, could we talk a little bit about the quality of nutritional supplements? I read, I read in your book, uh, there's a list of something like 20 um, additives that are often put into nutritional supplements of, of, different, oh. of different quality. And I'll tell you and how, many, how many of them are necessary. None. Zero. The reason they're put in is that um, it's easier in a factory type process it just makes for smooth running, you know, um, factory processes. That's all. They're not for the good of the person consuming them. So you want to take your magnifying glass when you look at the ingredients on a package of supplements. Right? On the bottle, it should be first vitamins and minerals listed, and then just the capsule, basically. Um, and if you see in things like calcium carbonate or some form of sugar, some form of colouring, and only then tiny amounts of vitamins and minerals towards the end, then it's rubbish. And most of them are rubbish. I would not ever get supplements from a chemist or the supermarket. I would only go to a health food shop, and even then, I would take my magnifying glass. And I do mention certain brands that I trust in the book, um, but any brand can be taken over, sadly, by a big pharma company at any moment, and then the ingredients list will slowly start to change. And um, and I guess a big part of all of this, of course, is the quality of the how how the gut is absorbing all the nutrients. Yeah. I mean, you know, we start off with diet. We want the gut to absorb everything it can from food, but because we've had decades of intensive farming, you know, even the best food, you know, even the broccoli may not have as much magnesium or calcium in it as it had fifty, sixty years ago. Which is why some people need some supplements some of the time particularly in a British winter, vitamin C, vitamin D, a little bit of zinc, tiny bit of selenium uh, for most of us in the winter. Um, but yeah, um, chapter six is called Nourish and Flourish. And it's about when you might need supplements, when is best to take them and how to choose a brand that puts no artificial additives in. And it will be more expensive because there's no such thing as a free lunch. And um, if someone suspects that they have problems ab absorbing nutrients, are there any ways they can get around that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we would always start with anything by looking at the health of the gut, right? So first, what's the balance of the good bugs and the bad bugs? You can test that, but you can also make an educated guess. And I would use, first of all, diet, right? You've got to cut the sugar out completely, or you will have an overgrowth of abnormal fungi and unfriendly bacteria. So when you've cut the sugar out of your diet completely, and it's not easy, but it's perfectly possible. And again, I describe how to do it in the introduction and in chapter two, bring, bring cleaning your gut. So you cut the sugar out, eat loads and loads of leafy green vegetables. Then you add in a probiotic, the good bugs. And then if things still aren't right, you use herbal remedies to get rid of the unfriendly bugs. And there are loads. Again, I list them. No, there's... There's golden seal, there's black walnut, there's uh, caprinic acid, um, and there's grapefruit seed extract. Uh, there are loads and loads of herbs that herbalists have been using for hundreds and thousands of years, actually, um, to get rid of the bad bugs. But that's the order. Clean up the diet, add in loads of leafy greens, cut up the sugar, then add in the probiotics, and then uh, add in the herbs to get rid of the unfriendly bugs. And that sorts it in 90% of cases. If you want to make sure your children don't have those kinds of gut problems and therefore problems absorbing nutrients, breastfeed them. 
breastfed children, even as adults, even as older adults, have far fewer gut problems. And can people sometimes take the uh, nutritional supplements in a liquid form or a powder yeah. form? Yeah, it's much easier to absorb them as liquids or powders. So where the manufacturers provide that, I would do it. Yeah. And um, we, I, don't, I think we didn't mention Epsom salt baths. Which, Epsom salt um... baths is magnesium sulfate. It's one of my seven detox methods. Um, and it does help with detox in a couple of ways. The magnesium helps to push out the heavy metals. And the sulfate helps with detox, particularly of estrogens, which is important for women. Um, but also is profoundly relaxing um, because the magnesium goes into the muscles and helps the muscles relax. But the other detox methods are saunas, organic vegetable juicing, anonic hydrotherapy, not for everyone and not too often, um, sprouting seedlings on your windowsill. If you're short of zinc and you're not absorbing well, you put a little bit of zinc drops, a few drops of zinc, in the water in which you soak the seeds and the water with which you water them. The plants will absorb the zinc and you will be much better nourished by eating those little plants. Vitamin C at very high doses, which you build up gradually. And again, I describe how to do. Um, that clears the gut. It's for immune support and it's for detox, especially of heavy metals. And the seventh method is specific supplements for specific toxin. So, for example, silica gets rid of aluminium. Um, and you know, there are loads and loads of things that help get rid of mercury. Um, and you know, zinc plus methionine will help get rid of nickel. It's all in there in Chapter 7. Dr. Goodman, thanks so much for taking the time to talk about these important subjects today. Where, where can people follow you or follow your writings? Um, oh, yes, I am on all those social media channel thingies. Um, probably best to find them via my website, which is drjennygoodman.com. Uh, but I am on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, especially Instagram. And if you're going to ask me what the handles are, I've no idea, but I believe you can find them through my website. Yes, yeah, I'll, I'll put those links in the show notes and the description. Thank you, Justin. It's been a pleasure okay. to talk with you. Yes, you too. Thanks again. Good to see you again. Uh, yes, indeed. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Self Sovereign Podcast. If you found the information useful or interesting, then subscribe to the podcast and share it with others. Also, please check out the links in the description, which are related to what was discussed today. Thank you.